have with us this evening uh, Dr. Stuart Saunders Smith from the University of Maryland um, at uh, Baltimore County. Yep. That's correct. I almost get mixed up with the other campus. Right. And uh, he's going to be talking to us tonight about his music. This afternoon, uh, we, in the uh, CFA 100 course, uh, heard an excellent lecture that went on for nearly an hour and a half, uh, which included discussion with the audience on uh, uh, Dr. Smith's use, not non-use of technology, and his reasons for not using it. And uh, we have uh, this on videotape and on audio tape, and I would like to welcome you to request copies of that lecture, um, which uh, if you give me an audio tape, uh, I'll have Joe <laughs> make a copy. <laughs> Are you looking? I'll have John have make a video. <laughs> but we're, no, we're, we're, we'd be very happy to make a copy of the the lecture for you, a uh, copy of the VHS um, videotape also. I'll give to you Hi. Um, basically, I thought what I'd do today is play some recorded examples of our music with uh, introductions, and then also perform a few speech songs, which I've been developing over the years. Songs for speaking voice rather than singing voice. Uh, do you know if this system works? Better um. give that a shot. Well, just keep on rather informal. The lecture I gave this afternoon was about as formal as it gets. You know, I read and it's all very intellectual. So I relax a little bit today. The first piece is a recorded piece. Are there any pianists in the audience? I have. I should speak up. <clears throat> the first piece is called Pine Top for Solo Piano. And it was composed in 1976. Pine Top Smith was one of the originators of the boogie woogie uh, piano style that I've always been fascinated by, mainly because of its uh, its contrapuntal independence between two lines, which is something that fascinates me continually. I love counterpoint, and I love the independence. Uh, rhythmic independence of the boogie woogie players. Um, I started off with the idea of writing a piece called Fields for Piano, uh, a piece that, um, if you looked from a distance, looked like it was just one field, but like any field, when you get up close, it's made up of very disparate elements. And Pine Top is like that. Eventually, I changed the name to Pine Top because the fields didn't have a poetic sense that really led me to focus the piece. And uh, thinking about Pine Top Smith did that kind of touch, that kind of rhythmic independence, that kind of expressivity. You will not hear any <coughs> quotes of Boogie Woogie or uh, that sort of thing. It was a takeoff point for me for the piece. I have two copies of the scores. If anyone would like to look on, you can certainly do that. Anyone else here? 
You can all crowd around if you'd like, it's fine. <coughs> Pianist is Paul Hoffman, who I've worked with for, oh, 15 or 20 years. It's about five minutes.
blanket. Lalalicket. Night. And Atlantic. Ocean. Landfill blindfold. No, 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 no. Blank. It. White. Hanger. Closet, we hurt. Wire celery, cardboard anger. Shirt, wall hangings. Closet chop suey. Suicide. Windows, indoors, ill. Lettuce, laces, mocha din, and how beans win all. Frost flowers. Smoking or ice or out of low king moors. Lattice. Window. My sill. Porch. Ch. Urch. Hot. Ch. Ridge. So high an inch. Port of call. Political. Poor little cult. A difficult. Wine, porch, church, hot, ch ridge, subway inch. Tofu, soul food, begin I so, so I can happen so, sucrose, so gross. The goof ball, ball. I e cat, jer, quin, ish, land, keto. Vendo spin, I azing all, foot earth, ear e all. Mo dift foo, mo dift foo, o oars come, o die. Do so vol and gory lose, golly up earth, golly up earth, gent o's. See? Ah. When we go, plants live on green heron wind. When we call hungry errands, one week old, answer. When winter hung be air, me and slide Homer in, then red hot liver and let sleeping, there we call. I sigh inside between sea lengths in open spaces. I elen inside sounds. As slent stuffing sky with seaside since and then thinks its own limits on an island of e sea lengths. I sigh lens. I see some of my friends from the percussion department here, so I'm going to change my pace a bit and accommodate them. And We'll have a performance of Lynx number four, <clears throat> subtitled Monk. This was written the year that Phenolius Monk died. And it starts off with little quotes from Round Midnight, which gradually become Silent Night, because Monk passed. Uh, I don't, the music's quite complex. <clears throat> it is as difficult, if not more difficult, than Link's number five, which you all heard this night. So, I will leave you the score. The percussionist playing is Stephen Schick, who was probably one of the great solo percussionists in the world. It's absolutely phenomenal. If anyone would like to come over and look at the score, this is very informal. Please do. Uh, it's on cassette. That's right here.
I tried to do, let me explain the Link series a little bit. I think that's probably important. I've been writing vibraphone music since 1974. The first three vibraphone pieces are basically monophonic, <clears throat> although they try to make allusions to counterpoint, much as Bach did with uh, his unaccompanied cello music. I mean, there's, this, there's ways to do that. Um, and Link's number four and number five, I really asked the question, how much counterpoint can a vibraphone stand? How much, how many lines can you get to going on that small of an instrument with that range? And I found that technically it's, it's amazing how much you can really do. I think you'll hear that with this piece. It's, uh, but we have, also, we've developed extensive uses of <coughs> rolls with one hand that sound just as good as if they were two. It's a very simple technique. The bar is like this, and if you use just the white notes, and you have one hand having two mallets, and you position it like this on the bar, then you can just go all over the place playing rolls and then play another line up here. And it sounds very effective. It sounds like two players. And it's, it's it technically, no, I'm simple. Kid can do it. So you'll hear a fair amount of what sounds like it could be impossible, but it isn't. It's just simply a use of that technique. <coughs> I don't know what the levels are like on this, so if we have to play with it, that's fine. Starts off rather softly, picks up quickly.
going on there. What's that? The idea of the virtuosity of this particular musician. He learned this in three weeks and he played it from memory. And there's no harder piece in the literature as these gentlemen will attest than this. Quite an amazing musician, really, really amazing. <clears throat> I'd like to do another speech song collection, seven short pieces <coughs> called In Bingham. Bingham, Maine, I'm from Maine, it's a small town, um, oh, probably a third to a half of the town is my relatives, <laughs> and the rest of the relatives live in Moscow, Maine, which is just about a mile from Bingham, and uh, I summered there, and I have um, roots in Maine. Feel like I'm from Maine, even though I live in Baltimore. I haven't really left Maine. Anyway. In this piece, I'm going to be performing in two dialects. I'll speak normal English, as I am now, and then I will speak Maine English. And I'll go in and out of it. These pieces have to do with death and dying and things passing. So we are We're prepared for that. <clears throat> we went to the store for pop. Couldn't find hide nor hair. Just wasn't there. Don't you know? Sitting down the street in cars, quiet, watching. Out and go with anyone. Walking by tombs that rest the ones dead in winter. Well, you sure can't plan them then. Used to scare the hell out of me. Still does. Out early, boating on the pond, mist coming off the water. Sight melting out like smoke extinguishing. I've been here before with my lines and waiting for the day when I'll be without my blanket and my covers will burn in the sun. Yup, he's a gonna. Body flaps both sides, struggles to breathe in water that isn't there. No limit can save him now, like no hunting save that big buck wandering into Baltimore, killed dead on the beltway, the laws flashing reds bleeding out of that hole in his side, his blood being all he was left to say. Hey, up, he's a gunner, all right, just sit in, stiff as a boy. When I was little, my Uncle Amos let me help him with roofing jobs. It made me feel big and worth something. He died by falling in an acid pool for stripping bark from trees. By the time they drained the pool, he was cooked. We used to take the old roofing off before putting on new. When they tried to take his clothes off, Everything came with it. So they had to bury Amos in his old roofing. That was all that was left of the house. He died very late at night between dreams. Mm, yes, sir. He parked in the dark by the harbor. And the sea goes out, don't it? And never comes back the same. No, it just don't. Ain't no wise about it.
next thing I'll do, again because percussion is present, is just play you a little bit of some of the jazz music I've written. Uh, I've been long interested in third stream music, long after it's been out of fashion. And um, <clears throat> I wrote a very big piece, well, we'll just play a little bit as you get a, a little piece of it, called Blue. And it's based on <coughs> a transcription of, I don't, let me see, uh, Black and Blue by Louis Armstrong. And um, it's like a theme in variations. Everything you hear, every cymbal crash, drum, part, you name it, is written out. I mean, it's totally written out. Oh, if the drummer's only here, the score for the drum part. Um, what I wanted to try to do was to combine early jazz and the new thing. The new thing was a jazz style of the 60s, which was highly contrapuntal. Everyone played as a soloist. There was no one accompanying, and like in bebop or in swing, you'd have a soloist and people would accompany the soloist. In a new thing, the idea was everyone was just going to play. Everyone was going to solo at once. That's very analogous, interestingly enough, to early jazz, where you'd play the tune, but then everyone would play an embellishment on the tune collectively. I wanted to make that connection. Um, and I got some marvelous players. Sal Macchia, when he's not playing with Max Roach, plays with the Juilliard String Quartet. He's the bass player. Uh, Robin DeSessa. <clears throat> You'll hear him play drum set, he speak for himself. Wayne Cameron is one of the uh, best trumpet players in Baltimore and teaches the Peabody Conservatory. And they really took a very difficult piece and made it sound easy. I'll play maybe the first five or six minutes to give you a taste of this music. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's about a 20 minute work and I, I want to give you a smattering of what I've been up to. Well, let's just go on if I do it. Okay. You'll hear the theme in the trumpet alone, and then they do a series of variations, although I, it's not in a traditional variation form. That's just the end of the pun <laughs>
on to other sections and that's well worth <coughs> which was sensitive. But one more piece that I have plenty of scores for everybody. This is a, the earliest piece I've been presenting today. Uh, it's written in 1973, when you just heard it in the late 70s. And this is for large romantic pipe organ and two percussion. And if anyone would like to see have some scores on that here. <coughs> down here. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, the idea behind this piece, which I don't think I did, <laughs> but I tried anyway, was to make a piece where there was just like no ref no <coughs> references, that everything would be just new material. It would be like, uh, uh, I thought of it as a quilt, where you just had like little bits of this, tag onto this, tag onto that, and I tried to I compose one day this part and then try to forget what I did the next day and just start afresh. <coughs> Unfortunately, over time, it sounds more and more cohesive. <laughs> it's either I've changed or the piece changed or uh, whatever, but um, that was the idea of the piece. And, and I, because I wanted to create a kind of dream state, and dream states are not linear. They're very, as you, all of us know, uh, they go in various directions, and they seem to be out of time. And I wanted to create that kind of ambience. The title, Two Makes Three, uh, it was a celebration of uh, the birth of our first daughter. Uh, so two makes three. It seemed to me quite magical at the time, kind of unbelievable. And now two makes four. four. <laughs> um, Soon eight. No. <laughs> I, I, I suppose I shouldn't be saying this, but our first two children were not planned, and then we planned to have one more. <coughs> two. So, so much for planning. Anyway, <coughs> two makes three. Yes, we'll hear that in this entire, about a ten minute piece, and we'll, then we can have questions or whatever.
uh, prepared part of my lecture, and if there's any questions, I'm here to answer them. And if not, I'll go get something to eat and drink. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, use of the two in the instruments are nice in this. Uh, the Tom Roll uh, linkages. <coughs> Spent a long time figuring out what stocks would do what. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Sometimes it was hard to tell almost where one starts and the other stops. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get those kind of clouds. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of clouds of metal floating. It sounds particularly effective in a big cathedral or just mm -hmm. you know, wonderful presence. Um, I noticed that in, in much of much of your music, um, it, it seems as though it's a succession of compressions, uh, decompressions, um, very much in a style that reminds me of, of conversation, dispute, and contemplation. How do you react to that? Yeah, a good deal of my music is based on spe speech rhythms. I mean, the vibraphone music was a conscious effort to capture, as you hear me speak, or you, we all speak, we speak in enormous varieties of durations and rhythms, which are not da 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 I mean, they're sevens and fives and sixes, and, and it makes the music breathe for me in a very organic way. And also, I don't like um, uh, periodic rhythms very much. I, I hear the marching off to war. I grew up in a household where World War II was a real presence in my father. He was in constant pain from his war wounds fighting. And it led me to become a Quaker. And therefore, it's hard for me to write periodic rhythms because periodic rhythms tend to mean to me marching. And I'd rather my music not march, but sing. And sing in rhythms which are Breathing rhythms, not dead force points. So you hit the button right on the head. <laughs> <laughs> How did you look at your songs? Um, yeah, it's a good question. You, if somebody else did it, how would they? Right. The in Bingham is relatively easy. Um, I just marked off the the sections that you were supposed to be in the Maine dialects. You just simply have to, if you, let's say, if you were not from Maine, you'd, there are plenty of tapes and, and dictionaries for Maine dialect that you could consult and, and do. For the um, other songs, <clears throat> there's a variety of things. For instance, remember the one Port ch ch yeah. Church, right? Well, there's just rhythms written there with it. Um, and then, like, when I do yesterdays, mm, yesterdays, remember that one? It, it just it says here, sing opening melody of Beatles tune yesterday, but just the word yesterdays, and then, so there are like, stage directions a good deal of the time. Um, in my opera, I, I really use that a lot. For instance, there's one place where <coughs> the person goes, I, Dick Disroused About, God, Yahoo, God, Scared, Sousman, Humpjack, Herbalist, etc. And the directions are, say that as if that was a traditional wedding oath. So you get the, the rhythm of the traditional, I take this person so-and-so, but <clears throat> um, with these nonsense syllables. So the audience sort of has this feeling like, gee, I should be understanding that, but you got me, you know. So there's, there's ways of controlling <laughs> rhythm <coughs> with stage direction, regular acting theatrical stage direction like that. And I, experimented with that uh, a lot. I was uh, the musical director for Herbert Blau's Kraken. I don't know if you know Herbert Blau's work. He uh, founded the Actors Workshop in San Francisco, then founded CalArts, then was the director of Lincoln Center, and then got thrown out because his politics were too radical. And um, I, I, would, I would work with his group. So I learned a lot from him about theater and text and I hope he learned something from me about structure. Because I, I composed Return and Recall, which is a uh, transmedia work. 
I think it's a notational system that can work for actors, dancers, or musicians. In other words, if, it, if, a, if a dancer does it, it's a dance piece. I mean, it's, it's movement notation. That same notation can be used uh, for music or for mime and, uh, or for interdisciplinary work. And I've seen it done in various ways. Has it ever been done simultaneously? Mm -hmm. What is yeah. this called? Tran uh, it's called Return and Recall. It was performed last night. Mm -hmm. We have it on videotape. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Professor Sin has the score. Here's what the notational system looks like for the piece. And then there's a lot of directions on how it works. It's basically a system which is not content specific, but action specific. You can plug in whatever content you want, but then once you plug that content in, these, do, these symbols tell you what to do with that information. And it is specific enough that you can recognize it from medium to medium. In other words, if you, saw a mu if you heard a musical rendition and then saw a dance rendition, you'd say, oh yeah, those are the same forms. Uh, I worked on this for a number of years to try to have it so that it was flexible enough to go from medium to medium, but specific enough so that it would actually recognizable from medium to medium. That was the, the trick of it. Yes? Have you had any formal theater training? I um, did almost 50 Broadway shows as a drummer. So I was around theater a great deal, worked with dancers, I mean, in, you know, just in commercial work. Um, at the age of 13, I started playing in nightclubs. And uh, I think I probably played everything from the circus to symphony concerts to uh, jazz clubs to uh, Greek polka bands, uh, you name it, I played in, in, in those settings. And I find that all something I draw on. I think that uh, as a composer, it's very important to be a practical musician and know what that's all about. I mean, I have called upon uh, musicians to do things that are almost impossible. But um, I do it for a reason, and I know how hard it is, and I've worked it out, and I know it's possible. So I'm not just guessing. Um, How long have you been working with the written word? I mean, the, the, the word pieces? Since I was 16. So they've always been a part of your, I noticed even in this this, this piece. Right, yeah, yeah. I, I just simply wrote poetry uh, almost as early as I wrote music. It's, it's interesting because of the rhythmic flavor of the words. Yeah. It, it was just a very natural thing. I mean, literally, mommy, daddy, paradiddle, that became other words that I would play with. Mm -hmm. I, I, I grew up in rural Maine, and I would go around yelling out words and playing my snare drum in the woods. There's, there's no one else around. I mean, do all kinds of strange things, and no one would even think they were strange, because there's no one there to say, gee, that's strange. You know? so, we all did that sort of thing. I think so. We all ended up in music schools and whatever. <laughs> but I really do think that Percussion training is one of the best training for a uh, composer. Because when I went to study with Charles Newcomb at the age of six, he was a vaudeville drummer. And I was expected to learn how to improvise tangos, improvise in jazz style, learn Sousa marches, know my rudiments, play jazz, play orchestral excerpts. I mean, it was a whole variety of things, part of which was learning improvisational techniques in particular styles. If you do that at an early age, composition is as natural as eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. If you, and then my, one of my daughters studies violin. She doesn't learn how to play bluegrass. She doesn't learn how to play jazz. She just learns one piece after another with no creative input whatsoever on her part. So she gave it up. And frankly, I don't blame her. I mean, being creative with sound should be part and parcel of every musician's stock and trade just because it's fun. That doesn't mean every musician is going to be more a composer than a performer. Many of us really thrive on interpreting other people's work, and that's beautiful. But to have some skills at improvisation, some skills at just having fun making sounds, and I think that applies to other mediums as well, theater and dance. I think it's just normal things that should be in our curriculums and, and fostered as a healthy, balanced kind of artistic uh, education. I was fortunate I just played the drums. <coughs> well, you've been a really wonderful audience to perform for and 
listen to it, and I thank you for your uh, hospitality.